Hey, good, good morning. So what is the name of this storm we got out there? Yeah, Isaias, I think that's how they're saying it. I'm, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to call it. Isaiah. <laughs> New Testament, Isaiah, when it goes, when you go from, uh, to, to, to Greek to English, Isaias. So that's what I'm going to call it, Isaias or Isaiah. So guess where we're going to turn in the Bible this morning? Book of Isaiah. Old Testament, chapter 12. Interesting when... Uh, Unsaved folks, or you presume that most of them are unsaved, try to pronounce biblical words, right? It's always very interesting. 1 Corinthians, they often will say. All right, from Isaiah chapter 12, let's read the entire chapter. It's only six verses long. Isaiah chapter 12. All right, verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 12. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord. Call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. So this morning's message is, how, first off, why you should praise God, and second part is how to praise God, how to do it. So let's pray together. Lord, we ask for your help today. We know that we certainly need the power of your Holy Spirit here today. Uh, we want you to receive the honor and the glory, and we know that your Holy Spirit is one that teaches us and reveals spiritual truth from your word. And we just want to ask you this morning, Lord, to do a great work in every one of us. Pray that we would not resist the movement and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Pray that you would just do a great work in all of us, and it would really move us to to do something for you. And I pray that we would all just get a real glimpse here today of the reasons why we should praise you and then understand how how really simple it is to do so if we just take the time. And uh, we just pray for edification of the body of Christ today uh, through this message. I pray you do your work, Lord, and not be hindered in doing so. And we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, the, the name Isaiah means salvation of the Lord. Isn't that interesting, the name of a hurricane? Salvation of the Lord. You think, you think the Lord might be uh, trying to get everybody's attention if somebody just took the time to research what Isaiah means? And they see a hurricane, they panic. And yet, if you look up the, name of the, the meaning of the name, it's salvation is of the Lord. Isn't that something, how the Lord does that? You remember uh, Hurricane Matthew a couple years ago. And it happened in October. And there was a, there was a verse, I think it's Matthew, I want to say maybe 10 to something about repenting. That when that hurricane came through, and I think the Lord does it on purpose sometimes. What do you think? If people just pay attention, they'll see that the Lord's trying to tell them something, even in just uh, the world we live in, natural occurrences, or I should say occurrences that the Lord allows, not natural, because he's in control. So there's uh, interesting things about the book of Isaiah. It's a really neat book. It's a long book. Anybody know how many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? There are 66 chapters. Now here's what's really neat. And I'll let you get off on this on, on your own and study it a little further, but I'll, I'll tell you something really neat. The scholars, and I say quotes, they say that there are two different authors of the book of Isaiah. And they call this the Deutero-Isaiah theory. Do, do you feel smart hearing that word, or those words, the Deutero-Isaiah theory? If you were in a seminary, they would say that, and they would, you're supposed to feel smart whenever that's said. Let me give you the, simply what that means. The scholars believe that there's not one person that wrote the book of Isaiah, but two. So here's what gets really interesting. Guess where they divide the 66 chapters to say there's one writer for the first part and the set, there's another author for the second part. Does anybody want to just guess at what chapter do they divide? Anybody know? A few of you know this. I think I heard over here. Close, close. Ready for this? 39, the first 39 chapters 
is one author. Now, hopefully you're getting this. The last 27 chapters is a different author. I won't take the time to go there this morning, but if you'll read chapter 39 and then chapter 40, you'll see a, a stark difference in context, just what's going on. And you're going to think, wow, this is almost like a different book. Now, did you catch it? 39, 27, 39 plus 27 is 66. How many books in your Old Testament? 39. How many books in your New Testament? Isn't that something? There's a division right there in the same spot that divides Old from New Testament. So I'll let you study this out on your own, but you know what the book of Isaiah is? It's kind of like a mini Bible. And I'm telling you what's really neat, if you really want to get into this, you can actually match up the themes of a lot of the chapters with different books of the Bible. The theme of that book's really neat. Uh, well, I'm going to get off on all that. I'll just give you one thing to study on your own this week. The 40th book in your Bible would be the first book of the New Testament. 39 in the Old. So the 40th book of the Bible would be the, uh, the first book of the New Testament, which is Matthew. Really interesting. You'll read over there. Matthew chapter 3 will line up perfectly with Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. And that is one of many things. I, I gave you one more, just so you don't think it's just one thing. What's the last book in the Bible? Revelation. Check the last part of Isaiah chapter 66 to line up almost perfectly with, uh, with uh, Revelation, I believe it's chapter 22. It's going to line up almost perfectly. It's really neat. So that's something you can study on your own. But we got a, a mini Bible here, the book of Isaiah. And a lot of Isaiah, particularly particularly the first 39 chapters, is going to focus heavily on a certain group of people. Do you want to guess who that would be? You folks that were here yesterday at our Bible study, we talked a little bit about this. Israel. Israel. That's God's folks in the Old Testament, isn't it? Notice in verse 1. Notice in verse 1. It says, and in that day. You see that? That little phrase, or those two words, that day, shows up over 40 times in the book of Isaiah alone, that day. And it's a day out in the future, that day. And there's a great day coming in the future, folks. Do you know what day that is? It would be, in your Bible, it's called the day of the Lord. Now, there's actually two different facets of the day of the Lord. Part of that is a time of judgment on this earth, followed by a time of great rejoicing on this earth. Now, did you catch what I just said? Time of judgment followed by great rejoicing. What turns the judgment into great rejoicing, folks? Anybody want to guess? It is the physical, literal return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. And he just happens to set up his kingdom in what nation? Israel. So what we're going to read, what we read here applies specifically to the nation of Israel. I, I'm not going to take the time to go through all that that applies to Israel today, but if you just have that in mind and you read that chapter, you can see in verse 1 that God was angry with them. And then what happens to his anger in verse 1? It's turned away. And then it goes on to talk about, behold, God is my salvation. So rather than focus on how that applies to Israel, I'll let you kind of study that on your own. Here's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to take a spiritual application in this chapter that goes really good with you and I, and our salvation. So uh, three points this morning. Here's the first point. Let's talk a little bit. We've got to get some rough part out of the way first. You ready? First point this morning is God's anger. Don't worry. Stick with me. It'll get better. But let's talk about God's anger. Notice again verse 1. And that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, thou, though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. And I'll give you the short part here. Before you were saved, if you're saved this morning, you know the Lord Jesus Christ is Savior. You called on to save you. Before that, the Lord was angry with you. You were against God, and he was angry with you. If you got saved, guess what happened? You became a son of God. Now, can the Lord get angry with his children? Yes, he can, but at least you're not going to face his wrath, though he might get angry. 
if you're not saved, you'll face his wrath and his anger. All right? So let's talk about, this is going to apply both ways here. Let's talk about God's anger for a moment. If you would go back to Exodus chapter 4, a few places here about God's anger. Uh, this ought to specifically apply to uh, saved people here. I'm going to give you four things. We could go all day on this, but I'm just going to go a few minutes here. Four things that make God angry. And the reason why I picked these things out is they, I, they specifically applied to me. I got a feeling they'll probably apply to uh, many of you as well. I think this is probably just people in general. Say people in general have a struggle with these things. Let's talk about things that make God angry. Exodus chapter 4. Look down there at verse 10. This is the call of Moses. And you remember God called Moses to do a great work, didn't he? And Moses, you know what Moses did? I, I, I have a lot in common with Moses in this regard. Moses made excuses as to why he could not do what God called him to do. Now, I know you never do that. But there have been many times in my life here, and I, the Lord's done this here recently with me again, and he said, I want you to do this particular thing. And I said, Lord, no, I can't. Did you know that is exactly the place where God wants you to be? For you to acknowledge, for you to acknowledge that you cannot. But not to stop there. See, Moses wanted to stop there. And I know I'm, I'm the same way. I can't do it. Lord, I can't do that. So I'll just, I'll just back out. God wants you to acknowledge that you can't do something so that you will have to wholeheartedly, 100%, put your trust in him to do the job that he called you to do. Because who's going to get the glory out of that? God will. You go out and do it on your own, say, I got this, Lord. And it just happens to, quote, go well. Who gets glory out of that? You do. You're stealing from the Lord when that happens, aren't you? If God's called you to do something, man. This is, this is something I, I know that I need to hear myself, and hopefully somebody here does as well. If God's called you to do something, he expects you to look at that thing that he called you to do and say, it's impossible, so that you will fall on your knees and cry out to him and say, Lord, you're into doing things that are impossible for me to do. So you're going to have to do it. So look at all Moses here making the excuse. First thing that makes God angry is people not trusting in him to do something he called them to do. Look at my Moses here, verse 10, 410. And Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not what? I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. What's Moses say there, folks? I am not a good public speaker, and you want me to go before this whole nation and speak to them? I can't do it. Look at the Lord's answer here in verse 11. This is good. And the Lord said unto him, look at the question. Who hath made man's mouth? What's the answer to that? The Lord did. I didn't make my own mouth. You didn't make your own. The Lord made yours and mine. Then look what the Lord says. Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Watch verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth. Look at the specifics there. He didn't just say, I'm going to be with thee. He said, I'm going to be with your mouth. And teach thee what thou shalt say. Okay. Look what happens here. Moses is not going to stop with the excuse making. Look at verse 13. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou wilt send. You know, you know what Moses is saying right there? Lord, just get somebody else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> the, this is after the Lord makes a plea with him about the fact that he will, the Lord, he, the Lord, will take care of this for him. And he's still, now I know you would never do that, would you? I've done that before. I try, you try to bargain with the Lord and say, but look, there's somebody else that can do a better job. And that's what he does here. So look at verse 14. And the, what's that next word, folks? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. You know why the Lord's angry here? Moses is not trusting the Lord to do what God called him to do. You know what that does? Makes the Lord angry. Now the Lord gives him Aaron here. The Lord uh, actually gives him Aaron here. He says, look, I'll let Aaron speak for you. But you know who ends up doing a lot of the speaking anyway? Whenever they go before Pharaoh and when they go before the nation, guess who does a lot of the speaking? Oh, Moses. See, uh, folks, the Lord wants you to trust him when it doesn't seem like you can do it. You can't do it, can you? I can do all things through... Come on now, that was not very good. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now that, that's very interesting wording. The King James Bible does not say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It says I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. 
understanding that when you do those things that he's called you to do, he will give you the strength to do it. You'll, here's the thing. God wants you to take that step of faith, and when you do that, the strength comes while you're actually doing what he called you to do. So you're doing the thing he called you in his power, and that particular thing gives you strength because you know, I'm doing this, but it's not me doing it. It's the Lord doing that. So folks, don't make the Lord angry and be an excuse maker to say you can't do something. God called you to do something, it might be scary. If God calls you to do something, it might seem like it can't happen. God's in the business of doing those things though, isn't he? Isn't God in the business of saying, hey, I know you're afraid, but trust me. Isn't God in the business of doing that? Over and over in the Bible, one of my favorite people in the Bible is Joshua. And I kind of think, you read Joshua chapter 1, I kind of think Joshua, even though he's a mighty man of, uh, of military power, I think that old Joshua might have had a hard time trusting God. And I'm going to tell you why. Read through Joshua chapter 1 and count how many times the Lord says to him, be strong and of a good courage. Be strong and of a good courage. And Joshua probably needed to hear that, because I know I do. He probably needed to hear that multiple times so that he would be, help me out here, strong and of a good courage. And if you read Joshua 1, 9, he says, uh, be strong and of good courage. And he says, it says over there that the Lord will be with him. How are you going to have strength and courage, folks? You're going to need the presence and power of the Lord God Almighty to have any strength and courage, aren't you? Okay, let's go to another one here. Things that make God angry. Not trusting God to do something that he called you to do. Trust him, folks. Go over to Numbers. Now, this one's going to be a little rough. Go over to Numbers chapter 11. Things that make God angry. Numbers chapter 11. Not a lot of commentary needed on this one. Verse 1. Numbers 11, 1. Now brace yourself. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his what? Anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Now you see that right there? A couple things. God's angry led to a lot of people in the camp of Israel, did you catch it? Dying. See how you don't want to be on the same side of God's anger and his wrath? <laughs> see what happens there? When the people did what? Why did it make the Lord, ang they, the Lord angry? What did they do, folks? Now, I know you'd never do that. You know why we complain. Let's think about this. Let's, let's dissect this. Psychologically, why do we complain? I'm going to give you a real simple. You don't have to get anything deep on this. Here's why we complain. You ready? Things don't turn out the way we want it to. Right? I just can't believe that. And it didn't happen the way you wanted. You know that God purposely allows me and you to be in situations that don't take place the way that we want. And it's a little reminder. The Lord's saying, you're not in control. I am. And it's also a reminder of, Lord, it didn't go like I wanted, and it's tough. And the Lord reminds you of, good. It's supposed to be tough. Then you'll stop trying to fix it. <laughs> All right? So see how... Things don't go the way you want to. The first inkling in the flesh is, ah, complain, right? Folks, when you want to complain, replace complaining with, Lord, I don't like, you can be honest with the Lord. Lord, I don't like the way this went. I'm not happy the way this went. But you must know better than I do. So I'm going to trust you anyway. Just replace that thought of complaining or those words that you would complain with, with that right there, that little prayer right there. So, uh, second thing that makes God angry, complaining. Philippians 2, 14 is a good verse to remember. Do all things, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Now, you know what murmurings are? Well, that's how we often complain, isn't it? <laughs> right? Because if you say it out loud, somebody actually might think, well, man, what's wrong with you? But you'll say it on your breath, won't you? And who hears that? The Lord hears that stuff. All right, so watch out. on. I'm glad you're laughing here with the complaining thing. We're laughing because we know that's how we do it, right? Okay, now let's get a little serious here. 
it made God very angry when the people complained. You know what that leads me to believe? God hates it when we complain. Because we're trying to think, Lord, you don't know what you're doing. Isn't that the root cause? Something's not right, therefore, if the Lord controls things and allows things to happen a certain way, then he must not know what he's doing. You see why that makes him angry? Because it's, it's basically saying, Lord, you don't know as good as I do. I know better. That's what we're saying, aren't we? So ditch that complaining stuff, folks. All right, let's go to another one. 2 Samuel 6. This one will be a little rough, too, so watch out on this one. 2 Samuel 6. Things that made God angry. Don't worry, we'll get to the good stuff here in a minute. 2 Samuel 6. Things that made God angry. Uh, go to verse 1 here. We'll read a few verses here. This is where David wants to... Uh, actually, I'll, I'll skip down to verse 3. This is where David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. So go down to verse 3. And they set the Ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the Ark of God. And Ahio went before the Ark. Now, you should know by now that... Um, there's something wrong with what we just read. They're carrying the Ark of the Covenant, but how are they doing it, folks? They put it on a cart with wheels. Over in those books that you often overlook in your Bible, whenever you do your Bible reading, there's some specific instructions on how to carry the Ark of the Covenant over there in Exodus. You know how they're supposed to do it? Yeah, they were supposed to carry that thing with sticks. You had a, a few of them that were supposed to carry the, the Ark of the Covenant. They had these uh, sticks that went through it, these staves that went through the sides of it, and they carried that thing. They were not supposed to put it on a cart. But folks, I mean, it's the same thing. They're moving it one way or the other. It doesn't matter, right? You better do things the way that God said to do it. Look what happens here. Look at verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fur. A uh, fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. Now, before I go on here, they have a desire to praise and please the Lord in this effort, don't they? Whole other message here, but if you're going to really praise God and please Him, you better do it His way, right? They got a real heart here to do it, but a real heart here to do it needs to be combined with obedience to God in how to do it, right? That's a whole other message there, but let's go on. Verse 6. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. Whoa, whoa. What happened there? Didn't Uzzah do a good thing in trying to steady that ark? Didn't he? Didn't he? He had the desire, he had the desire to do something that was right. But you got to go back over there and they weren't supposed to, over there next, they weren't supposed to touch that thing or else what happened? You die. That was fair warning given by God that they would do that. So notice that the next thing that will make God angry is, are you ready for this one? Disobedience to God's word. That will make God angry. And in this case, that anger is God's wrath, because what happens to this fella? He dies. Now, you think about it. You think he had good motives? This fella had a good motive. I'm going to save the ark from falling. Folks, people with good motives go to hell every day. I'm not saying that just because you have good motives, you're going to go to hell. I'm saying good motives are not enough. Good motives got to be mixed with knowledge of what God specifically said, don't they? Or else it can land a person in hell. Lots of, quote, good people end up spending eternity in hell because they did it their way instead of God's way. You got to do it God's way, folks. Salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Well, I lived a good life. And you know what? There's probably some people that if you counted the sins in their lifetime, sinned less than people who are in heaven saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's not about how many sins you committed, is it? It's about have you trusted the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ or not. Some motives, hey, you got to watch out. Make sure motives are mixed with knowledge of what God said, all right? Next thing, let's get to the New Testament here. Last thing on things that make God angry. Go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Things that make God angry. We've got not trusted in God to do something he called you to do. We've got complaining. We've got disobedience. Mark chapter 3. Look at verse 1. 
And he entered again to the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. Okay, so before I read verse 5, there's some men that are just looking to catch the Lord Jesus Christ and being able to accuse him, right? He knows that. He knows their hearts. Look at verse 5. And when he had looked round about on them with what? Anger. Now, why is he angry? Keep reading. Being greed for the what? Hardness of their hearts. He saith to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Folks, the last thing here I'll give you this morning on things that make God angry. Things that make God angry. Number four, a hard heart. A hard heart will make God angry right there. And the Lord is doing, isn't this something here? In the midst of the Lord doing a miraculous thing, he's surrounded by people with what? Hard hearts. That's why you need to check your heart when you come to the church building, folks. You know what God wants to do every time we meet here? You know what he wants to do? He wants to do great things in each one of us. You know, you can bring a hard heart in here, and it can prevent God from doing anything in you, and your hard heart can rub off on somebody else and keep God from doing something in them as well. Did you know that? Number four things that get made God angry, a hard heart. Now, go back over there to uh, Isaiah, and let's talk about something uh, on a doctrinal level here that I am thankful for. Back there in verse 1, it said there, uh, in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou, notice that next word, thou, what's the word? Is that, what's the tense on that word? It's past tense. Thou wast, past tense, angry with me. Thine anger is what? Turned away, and thou comfortest me. Wouldn't you rather have the Lord comfort you than to be angry with you? Folks, the Lord will comfort you and not be angry with you, first and foremost, if you're saved by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. You've trusted in him. And number two, if you're walking with him. Now again, God's anger, God's wrath, a little different here. When you get saved, you never have to worry about God's wrath again. Amen? Who suffered your wrath on, on, in your place? The Lord Jesus Christ. He took that cup, the cup of God's wrath on the cross for me and for you. Amen to that. Okay, therefore... God's not angry anymore with me and you, with you if you called on Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And what a comfort it is to know that. Amen? So, God's anger is turned away if you're saved, and now he wants to be a comfort to you. Now, the next thing we're going to cover here, that's God's anger, number one. The second thing we're going to cover here is God's salvation. So, we got that rough power out of the way. Now, let's have some fun here. And let's have a little rejoicing time. How about it? Look at verse 2. Behold. Next word, everybody. Say it for me, please. God is my salvation. Is there any salvation outside of the Lord God Almighty? Good, good memory verse uh, for you that goes along with this. Acts 4.12, many of you know it. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the name above all names. That's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Philippians 2. Uh, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. So notice verse 2 here. God is my salvation. Now, if that's the case, now think about this for a moment. If God saved you from hell, is there anything bigger than that in your life that you could face? Is there any bigger obstacle in your life that you could face that you could be saved from than hell? There's nothing bigger than that. Notice the next words after God is my salvation. It's three little words that are great. I will, what's that next word? Trust and not be afraid. How come? How come you have no reason to fear? Read it. Watch it. For the Lord Jehovah is my, notice the S's here. Here's a good little message for you. Is my number one strength. And my number two, song, he also is become my number three, salvation. Now, is God your salvation? You know what else he wants to be? He wants to be your strength, and he wants to be your song. Real quick, go to Isaiah, uh, Psalm 27. Good verse to go along with this. Psalm 27. 
give you a couple of references here on God is my salvation or God's salvation. Go to Psalm 27. I know this verse has certainly helped me at different times. Psalm 27. Look at verse 1. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my what? Now notice the next phrase. Whom shall I fear? Didn't we see that, something similar over there in Isaiah? God is my salvation, I shall not, I will trust, I will not be afraid. Didn't we see the same thing? You notice how the Lord connects. You'll see this all throughout your Bible. He connects his presence with the thing that everybody's concerned about right now. Being safe. Isn't that something? He connects his presence with being safe so you have no need to... What's the word? Rhymes with rear? I say rear because you need to put that in the back. Put, that in the, put the fear in the back. Replace it with the Lord in the front. Put the fear back there. Isn't that something now? How God's presence is connected with God's safety and protection for you. Amen? What, you, i got to get off here for a second on something. What is the number one thing that people in the world feel right now? in the last few months. Number one thing. Don't you dare say coronavirus either. Don't say that. That's not what they're afraid of. There's something bigger than that they're afraid of. What do you see if you, if you take the time to look online or watch the news? What do you see? You see data. And the data always tells you how many people have died. Isn't that the number one fear of everybody in our world today? Isn't that so? That's keeping from pe people from doing everyday things that they would never really think about doing. They're fearful of death. You say, no, they're scared of getting the virus. No, no, no. Who, who's never been sick in here? Who's never been sick in here? Come on. And I'm not trying to minimize. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to minimize this thing. And I know there's, there's certain groups of people that probably need to take some serious precautions. That's just being wise. At the same time, we've had sickness ever since Genesis chapter 3, hadn't we? We've had sin in the world, and sickness comes along with that. So you understand that that's something we're just going to have to deal with the sinful people, but God has a cure for sin. And if God has a reason for you not to fear death, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, st let's all just stop. Let's st stop with the fear. This world is fear-mongering. You might die. Isn't that the thing? You might die. Okay. Paul said, I am in a strait betwixt two. For I desire to, I desire to be with Christ, which is far better Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The Lord, what he's saying is, the Lord left me here because I got to do something for you. I'm going to be up there. Now, we can take the same attitude. Where would you rather be this morning? Come on. Who would you rather hear preach? You're not going to hurt my feelings at all. Who would you rather hear preach this morning? The Lord Jesus Christ or me? Come on. Who would you rather hear preach? Come on. You better say the Lord Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be better to be up there? Okay, the Lord's got us here for a time. Maybe for a short time, maybe for a long time. What are we supposed to do? Same thing Paul did. What did Paul do the entire time he was here? He said, I'm going to minister to as many people in the power of the Holy Spirit with the Word of God that I possibly can. So let's do it. And don't be afraid of dying. If you're saved, you've got no fear of dying, right? All right. A little side message. Go back to Exodus 15. Here's quite a situation. Here's quite a situation to be fearful. Exodus chapter 15. Here's these Israelites. They got out of Egypt. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. They got out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Got out of bondage. But you know what happened? They got a little ways down the road. And uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, Moses. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Isn't that what the Lord does? When you get saved, everything's not peachy, is it? People seem to think that. Oh, my life is just going to be peachy all the time. No, a lot of times it gets a lot harder, doesn't it? Because the difficulty should drive you on your knees. So you call on the Lord and trust Him. So look at uh, Exodus 15. These people are right on the brink of the Red Sea. And guess who is right behind them? Those Egyptians. Here they are, folks. This, this, pulpit, will be, this pulpit will be just out here will be the Red Sea. Here, right behind me, these, these, uh, these seats right here, here's the Egyptians. Okay, so I'm, you understand where I am? I'm, I'm represent the whole nation of Israel. I'm right in the middle. If I go forward, only so far, and I'm going to drown. If I go backward, well, they're going to kill me. Which way do I go? I'll go to the side. <laughs> You're probably not going to make it far, that far either. You're going to have to make a choice of one or the other, right? 
Go forward, go back. You know what the Lord tells those people to do? You know what he tells them to do? He said, go forward. In fact, great thing here in this chapter. Moses said, great words here. Moses said, stand still and see what? Come on, help me out. The salvation of the Lord. Now, you probably thought about Charlton Heston whenever I said that. But hey, you understand? Moses is right there with those Israelites. And he's, they literally have nowhere to go. And if you look at the end there, look at, um, uh, look at uh, Exodus, uh, rather, you're in Exodus 15. Go to verse 1 there, beginning there. It says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this what? Song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he hath thrown into the sea. What happened whenever they decided to go forward out of obedience? What did they do? The Lord opened up that Red Sea, and they were able to cross on dry land. And they get across the other side, and those Egyptians are right behind them, and the Lord closes that thing up, and all those Egyptians drown. So when you get to Exodus 15 here, you're in the place right after they have seen God work a miracle. And notice what they say. They say, God is my salvation there. And then, uh, actually, verse 2 is what they're going to say. Look at verse 2. The Lord is my strength. Watch the S's again. Strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father's God, I will exalt him. I want you to look at verse 3 here. Take a look at it. The Lord is a man of what? Let me just stop right there for a minute. You got any battles you're facing right now? You, you folks don't have any battles? Surely you do. The Lord is a man of war. You know what he wants to do? He wants to fight your battles for you. But you've got to ask him to help you go through the battle. When you, think of all the generals down through history that have been hailed as great men. You know who's the greatest of them all? How about the Lord? Wouldn't you rather have him be the commanding officer lead you into battle? And him leading the way and taking care of things you could never do? All right, so I noticed that thing there matched over what we saw in Isaiah with the strength, the salvation, and the song. That's pretty neat. Go back to Isaiah for a minute. Go back to Isaiah. And i uh, get you another thing here on salvation. I'll just probably make mention of a couple things here, and then we'll move on. God's anger, and we don't want that. Well, God's salvation gets rid of his anger, gets rid of his wrath. Look down there at verse 3, and he goes on here. This is still the same point. He goes on here some more about salvation. Look at verse 3. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the, what's that next word? The wells of salvation. Now, you're in your Old Testament, right? Doesn't your whole Bible kind of fit together? Can you think of any place in your Bible where salvation is connected with a well of water? Help me out, somebody. Salvation and a well of water. How about the woman at the well? Go over there real quick. Go over to John chapter 4. I'm just going to read a couple verses over here. Notice it says there that you shall, uh, shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Now, you only got to get saved once, Amen. But let's see if we can get something here out of this. Salvation's a one-time deal, but it says there, draw water out of the wells of salvation. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's read John chapter 4 here. Uh, if you would, go down to verse 13. This is the woman at the well, and Jesus Christ uh, having a conversation with this woman, this Samaritan woman. Look at verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall, what's that next word? Never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Folks, where is that well of water? What does it say right there? It shall be in him. Did you see that? In you. You, got, you mean you got a well of water in you? Do you know that? Well, you, your body happens to be made up physically a lot, a lot of water on the inside. But we're talking about something spiritual here. A well of water in you. What might that be? Okay, we're in Isaiah, John 4, go over to John 7. This is how you put these pieces together and see what the Lord's saying. See, if you just read part of the Bible, you don't get the whole picture. Go to John 7, look at verse 37. Put all the pieces together here. 737, think about wells of water. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of what kind of water? Lord, what is that water? Next verse. It's parentheses, but it gives you some very important information. 39. But this spirit...
spake he of the, the capital S spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Folks, what did he say in John 4? That well of water should be in us. John 7, you find out specifically what that well of water is. What's in you if you're saved? It's the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I know my Bible well enough, and you do too, to know that the Holy Spirit of God works hand in hand with God's Word. You know what I need to do? And you need to do every day of your life. You know what you need to do? You need to open this book and get a drink. All right? And that gets in you. These words get in you. Holy Spirit's in you. Holy Spirit works hand in hand with God's Word. They work together. Folks, you go three days physically without water. What happens to you? You can die. You will die. Christians all the time go days and weeks on end without getting a drink. And you know what? You would think that they're dead. Now, you can be saved and appear to the world as dead as a hammer. Did you know that? You better get a drink. You better get a drink every day. You better get a drink at least once a day, better yet, more than that. I always, I wake up in the morning, I sleep on mouth open, so I'm always dehydrated in the morning. I know that's probably more than information you wanted to know. But I always drink a big old 16-ounce glass and sometimes more of water. That's the first thing. And man, that thing tastes good. But at lunchtime, guess what happens? If I hadn't had water between that time and lunch, usually I drink my coffee, and of course that makes you dehydrated, doesn't it? Well, at lunchtime, man, I'll be, man, I'm thirsty. I need to get another drink. And then dinner time rolls around. You've got to have something to wash down the food, right? Get another drink. Now, that's three times a day. Now, I know you drink water more than three times, probably three times a day, right? You should. Is it okay to get in this book more than three times a day? You think it might be healthy for us to do at least once, better yet, two, three, four, five, or more times a day? What do you think? And it may be, here's a good little practice you might want to try. I have, I've got to wear this, this summer, um, <laughs> I've lived my life on three by five cards. I have a stack of them. I'll write stuff I need to do on them. You know what a good little practice to do is? Write verses on those cards. Put them in different places. Where you work, where you live. On your, uh, my parents, when I was growing up, I thought this was a great thing. They would put them, they would write them in, uh, I guess my mom used lit or something. She'd write it on the mirror. And you go in there, and there's that scripture. Folks, put that stuff in front of you. Uh, uh, many of you, many of you here, go to your house, you got scripture on the wall. Amen. Good little reminder throughout the day. Folks, put that where you can... Just get a quick drink. You know, if you got a water fountain close by, you just go by there real quick. And it satisfies you at least for a time, right? Get a drink and another drink and another drink as you go throughout your day, all right? Then you spend a lot of time on that. Let's get this last point here. Go to Isaiah 12. We got God's anger. We got God's salvation. This last thing. Oh, boy, this is good. Go to verse 4. Last thing here, God's greatness. God's greatness. Now, uh, before I read, let me just tell you, the message is this. Why you should praise God, and then how to do it. So here's the basics on if you haven't got the message this far. Why you should praise God. Hey, if God's your salvation, you've got reason to praise God, right? Now, you know what? The Lord's going to tell you how to do it. So watch verse 3 through 6 and see if you can catch it. Verse 4. And in that day shall you say, praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel and to thee. I'm going to tell you what, verses 4 through 6 tell you specific ways as to how you can praise God. Did you see them? I, I counted six of them. Six specific ways you can praise the Lord. Here we go. Verse 4 again. I'll give these to you in order. And in that day shall you say, number one, praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you the simplest way to praise the Lord. Use the same thing that God wanted Moses to use. What did God want Moses to use? The thing we like to use the most, the most active muscle in our body. What is it? It's your mouth. Folks, let your mouth pour out praise to the Lord. Now, you know what the mouth is going to pour out? I use that word on purpose, those words on purpose, pour out. It's going to pour out whatever you're filled up with. And everybody's full of something. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, you've been putting the Word of God in you, guess what's going to Word of God. Praise to the Lord God Almighty, Right? Easy way to give God the glory, 
Praise him with your mouth. Okay, keep going. Here's number one. Praise the Lord. Notice number two. Call upon his name. I tell you, I, I know uh, I hear folks pray, and, and this is between them and the Lord, but something kind of bothers me when I hear folks pray. I will, hear fo I, will hear, I will hear folks pray, and at the end of their prayer, they will say, in your name, amen. And that's fine, because they know and the Lord knows, right? I personally li love to hear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I sure like to know that that person is praying in the name of Jesus Christ, so that I know they're not praying to some other God. <laughs> that's, maybe that's his personal preference. But folks, if you're going to call the Lord, how about you call by his name? Call him the Lord. Call him the Lord God Almighty. You can call him Jehovah. You can call him Jesus Christ. Say those names. Those names have power, don't they? And let's make sure we're, we're praying to the one true God and not some other God. Because there's a bunch of little G-gods out there that folks pray to. You say, oh, really? Oh, yeah. So be careful of that. Let's make sure we're addressing the, the one true God. So call upon his name. Look at number three. Good one. Declare his doings among the people. Now, you don't have to answer out loud, but in the past seven days, did you tell somebody, no matter who it was, did you tell somebody something that God did for you? You tell anybody that. How's that? The Lord loves it when we brag on him because doesn't he get the glory out of that? Folks, it, I'll, I'll tell you, um, this happened to me on Friday. I, a fellow came to, I had a meeting with, and uh, I was not, I was semi-interested in his product, and then I told, he told me how much it cost, and I was almost not interested in his product at all. But we had a good conversation, and it, this is the neatest thing. While we're having a conversation about his product, I'm asking the Lord, I didn't have to say a word, I just said, Lord, I, I really want to witness this guy. I want to, I want to get the gospel in there. And right at the end, uh, I started asking him some questions, and man, the door just wide open. Just, it was the neatest thing. Just open. And I thought this guy was going to end up leaving, and I wasn't going to get this in. And right at the end of the conversation, I'm like, Lord, please, please help me to get this in there. I want to make sure. Wide open. And um, he listened, and he said to me, um, he, he asked me about coming to church. And uh, I, I was like, whoa. And then we had a good conversation after that about a, a few other things that, uh, that, I, that I was interested in, that he was interested in. And this, this relationship starts, and then he's going to call me in two weeks. And I may not see him in person, but I'll talk to him on the phone again. And I'm just telling you. What an opportunity. Here's a guy I never met before. If you'll just ask the Lord to open a door for you, I'm telling you, he'll do it. It's amazing. And I had an opportunity to tell that fellow what God has done for me and save him and how I'll do the same thing for him. Ask the Lord to give you those opportunities to brag on him, and he'll do it. I'm telling you, folks, he'll do it. So there's number three. Let's go on here. Number four. Make mention that his what? Name is exalted. And that kind of goes back to what I mentioned there about the name of Jesus Christ. I said a couple things about that already. There's number four. Eight mentioned that his name is exalted. I think that's important in the world we live in because you hear God's name used in a derogatory manner way more than you ever want to, don't you? Whether it's in the workplace or, uh, well, you got, you got control of the television so you can turn that nonsense off, can't you? But isn't that something? When pe isn't it interesting when people want to sound a thief, they know what name to use. Isn't that interesting? They use the name of God, they use the name of Jesus Christ, and they throw in some other words with it. But isn't that something? They really feel all oh, power is behind that. And they're right, they're just using it the wrong way. Isn't that something? God and Jesus Christ, those are often used by heathen people because they want to sound like, I got some authority. Isn't that something? That's a twisted way of using the, God, uh, using the Lord's name. Uh, let's make sure that we use it in a way where it's giving him glory. All right, make mention of his name. His name is exalted. Look at verse 5. Here's uh, number 5. What's that first word? Sing unto who? Okay, this is another message, but I'll just give you the, the, the 45 second version here. Folks, every time you come to church, you've got a chance to sing unto the Lord. Okay, now who are you singing to? A lot of folks, a lot of folks don't sing like this because they're afraid that somebody else might hear them and think that they can't sing you're probably not like that now you know I, I can't sing very well but I just figured out down the road I'm like I'm not singing for you I'm not singing for you uh, God gave me a loud voice God gave me a, a, a strong voice that's not me that's, that's the Lord uh, I, I, personally I think then 
if he gave me the ability to project, then I ought to do it. Now, God's going to go every one of you in here the ability to project to some degree, some more than others. Make sure you're projecting the way that God gave you the ability to do so and do it not for the guy next to you or the lady next to you so she thinks that you can sing well or not, but you're doing it for the Lord. That might make us sing a little louder. It might. See, people are afraid. I don't, I, I, I've heard that. Oh, I used that excuse myself years ago. I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't. And, and then somebody just put, pointed it at me and said, who are you singing to? Are you singing for you? Are you singing for somebody else? Or are you singing for the Lord? If you're singing for the Lord, it don't matter. Now, you've probably been in churches where there's been some, some man or lady that had a terrible singing voice, and they sang loud. You've probably been in those churches before. And you're like, oh, man. Folks, if that person is singing to the Lord, that sounds a whole lot different to the Lord than it sounds to me and you. And you shouldn't worry about that. I've been in a church up, uh, up in Chicago where uh, they had a big, big old section of uh, deaf people. And it was really neat because they had a person signing the, to the, all the people in that section. And of course, you know how it is when the, you got a preacher and you got a person doing the, the signing. It's delayed for them to get the message, right? This is one of the neatest things I've ever seen in my life. Big church, so lots of amens, you know, independent Baptist church and powerful preacher, lots of amens, but then you'd get a delay from those deaf people and they would go, ah! Ah! making some kind of noise, acknowledging that they agree with what that preacher said. They agree with what God said. And I thought, man, when I first heard it, I was like, man, that's kind of, I never seen anything like that with a lot of, and I thought, that's kind of weird. And then they kept doing it. They kept doing it. I thought, hallelujah, that's what it's supposed to be. How's that sound of the Lord? The Lord's like, yeah, I've been doing what I told him to do. So don't you worry about how it sounds. Last thing here on verse 5. Sing unto who? Why, he tells you. For he hath done excellent things. Has he done excellent things for you? Then sing to him. This is known in all the earth. Number 6 in verse 6. Ways to praise the Lord. Cry out and shout. See, that backs up the singing thing I just told you, didn't it? It backs it up. God wants you to make a loud noise if you can. Cry out and shout. Again, not for show, but to thou inhabitant of Zion. And there's your connection with Israel there. For great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Now, we're going to stop here, and we're going to leave in a moment. And you have no excuse as to, number one, why you ought to praise God. And number two, specific ways. No excuse, folks. So guess what the Lord wants all of us to do now that we're not guilty. I know. I can't make an excuse. What do you think the Lord wants us to do? How about we give him the praise that he deserves? How about we do that? If you watch anything on, you will hear how great this person is. And it might be a politician. It might be an athlete. It might be a talk show host. It might be a doctor. It might even be a preacher. How great. Just turn that nonsense off. None of those people is great. Who's great? The Lord is. It says great in verse 6. Great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Now if anybody is great, the only reason they are great is because God gave them the ability to be great. Ultimately, let's be honest here. Who's great? Okay? The Lord God Almighty is great. So we started talking this morning. I'll just remind you where we've been here. We started talking about things that make God angry. I gave you a few of those things. And all those things that make God angry, and there's a whole list we could have gone through. I gave you four. Not trusting God, complaining, disobedience, and all. All those things will prevent you from giving the praise to God that he deserves. So... Get rid of the anger that you stir up in the Lord by doing those things and replace it with praise to the Lord. And I'm telling you, you'll see the Lord there. So how's it with you today in those areas? I hope that uh, it will do a little self-evaluation. I, I tell you, if you didn't need this message, I did. <laughs> I, speak, I, I speak honestly there. These four things that make God angry just happen to be things that I, I struggle with. And maybe they match you, maybe they don't. That didn't mean. And the fact that I need to be reminded as to why I need to praise God, I need to hear that. <laughs>
And the fact that I didn't be reminded of, there's many ways, not just one way, but many ways as to how to praise God, I need to be reminded of that too. I know when I self-reflect on the last week, man, I, there's some areas where I just completely blew it. Okay, well, a new day, don't you? Got a new week ahead? The Lord doesn't come back? Let's make sure we take advantage of the opportunity to give God the praise in those specific ways that we talked about this morning, all right? Or the Lord said this morning. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for how, how good you are and just making things specific to our lives from your word. And I just pray that uh, our invitation time with you, we respond in a manner that... Uh, is exactly what you put your finger on in our hearts this morning. And uh, I pray that you would be praised in each of us this afternoon, no matter how things go with this storm uh, tomorrow and the week ahead, no matter how tough may things may get, may we praise you. And remember that you've got a reason for allowing us to go through these times. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.